And it ties together a lot of the other things that we're excited about. And let me explain what it is and also help you understand that there's a lot about what it is that's still in the process of being defined, which is why it's a great opportunity for Kathy and me to be here and to listen to your presentations and hear what ideas people have about how to make this as powerful as we want it to be. So first of all, uh, where, where did this come from and who was talking about it? Can we get the sound on? It's closer. Curing diseases like cancer and diabetes, and to give all of us access to the personalized information we need to keep ourselves and our families healthy. We can do this. Now notice who stands up. Everybody! <laughs> if you watch the State of the Union, I think there were only two other times where everybody stood up, so this is a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> that this is not a partisan event, and uh, there aren't too many in Washington that can claim that. So, Now that was January 20th, 10 days later in the East Room. Uh, the President announced more details about this. Harold Varnas and I uh, put in uh, the online version of the New England Journal a description more scientific and medical about what it is that this initiative aims to achieve, which I hope you've had a chance to, to look at. But let me walk you through what the pieces of this are as we currently contemplate them. And uh, this can also be looked at if you go to this website. You know, we will constantly be refreshing uh, what is uh, the, the status of this effort and all the planning that's going into uh, turning it into a reality. The concept, of course, is not new. I mean, if you go to the uh, optometrist, you expect you're going to get eyeglasses that are actually for you and not just the generic person. Uh, if you need a blood transfusion, you probably want that to be matched to you, and we've been doing that for almost a century. But I think the prospects for doing this on a broader base have come along uh, in a very exciting way. And it's still the case that much of medicine is one size fits all. And we'd like to change that if it's going to improve outcomes. Uh, and that includes uh, such things as genomics, of course, but also other kinds of technologies, access to electronic medical records, uh, the M-Health revolution, and so on. The National Research Council report in 2011 uh, focused particularly on this and focused on the term precision medicine as a way of capturing the idea uh, and certainly got a lot of people in the scientific community interested, but I'm not sure it had a lot of legs at that point. What we need now is a development of a rigorous research program to provide the scientific evidence to turn these concepts into reality. And to do that, and an explicit goal of all of us, is to try to recruit some of the best and brightest of this current generation of scientists to come and join this effort. Just as with the Human Genome Project, the success of the effort was not just having a vision about what to do, but it was luring all sorts of smart people to come and share that and then to put their best talents into making it happen. Because what we're talking about here is truly audacious, and it's only going to succeed uh, with that kind of talent coming on board. Now, uh, some might say uh, this is not a new idea. In fact, this is a paper I published in May of 2004, the case for a US prospective cohort study of genes and environment uh, based upon a working group that we put together at NIH to try to argue for the benefits of this and to see exactly what it would take to do so. Uh, so this paper came out, and um, let's just say timing is everything, and well, <laughs> landed with a thud, shall we say. But look at the difference now, 10 years ago versus now, and this is why this is the moment to make this happen, when you consider a table of this sort. Sequencing a human genome in 2004, roughly $22 million. Uh, we've come down a bit since then. Uh, Amount of time to do it also profoundly dropped. And very importantly for what we're going to talk about here, other kinds of technologies to capture information about individuals uh, from the point where maybe less than 2% of people had smartphones, now 58%. Uh, EMR adoption just really kind of getting going 10 years ago, now greater than 90% of providers uh, have this. And computing power, which we need, also going up. So putting all that together, uh, 2004 was probably not the time. 2015 is. And I think that's a strong reason why the President of the United States, who really got deeply interested in this and did a lot of homework, decided to make this uh, the number one scientific priority in biomedical research in, in the last couple of years of his administration. So what's the initiative about uh, to build a broad research program? 
There are two components here, and it's important to think about both of those and how they're going to play out, and they are connected. The near term is really to take the kinds of things we're learning about cancer, and I've mentioned TCGA, and the case we heard about this morning is another example of just how far this is coming, but how far it needs to go. How can we ratchet up the intensity of precision strategies for cancer? But in the longer term, how can we generate a knowledge base for all diseases, and actually not just disease, but also wellness? And that's where we get into this idea of a very large million or more strong longitudinal cohort in the United States. So let me say something about each part of this. First of all, this is the budget that was proposed in the president's budget. Obviously, that's the proposal that Congress is now wrestling with. Uh, the House appropriators uh, had a hearing on Tuesday where I and five of my institute colleagues appeared, and there was a lot of discussion about this, and I think it was fair to say a lot of excitement on the part of the House appropriators of both parties about what this could potentially turn into. But we don't know at this point exactly how realistic it will be to see new dollars identified for this by next October. We're proceeding as if that's going to happen. So the near term, applying the tenets of precision medicine to cancer, certainly we already are seeing trials emerge from the National Cancer Institute, like MATCH and Lung Map, which aim to do this business of connecting the genomic findings in a tumor with the therapeutics that are offered to the patient trying to do this in a fashion that is targeted drug therapy, sort of the smart bomb instead of the traditional chemotherapy, which is more like a carpet bomb. And these are two starting points, MATCH and lung MAP. If you haven't read about them, you might want to, but still on a modest scale. Maybe it's time to really push this harder, uh, identify new cancer subtypes, new therapeutic targets, test precision therapies with private sector partners because they are the ones who are developing the drugs, for a wide spectrum of adult and pediatric cancers, for early stage to advanced diseases, and incorporate within that the kind of liquid biopsies, which we'll be talking about later this morning, uh, in a much more su substantial way, after non-invasive detection of tumor response. Try to use the best science to understand when resistance develops, why did that happen? And what could we do to anticipate it? Because there's, <laughs> Lots of stories of stunning responses to single targeted drugs in various <coughs> tumors, unfortunately often followed by reports of relapse as the, as the cancer becomes resistant. How do we anticipate that? What do we do about it? One way, of course, is not to stick to monotherapy, but really try to move this approach into combination, which is, I think, the future, but a very difficult future to see how you're going to carry that out in a way that you can anticipate what FDA is going to try to do with the data when you have patients who are in multiple different combinations. How do you actually decide what worked? 